Treacheries of the Space Marines The Master's Bidding By Matthew Ferrer No, he said with a nod to Chengrel. No, I was not born among the first of our legions as you, venerable Master Chengrel, were. I never saw the face of the living emperor. I have never set eyes upon terror or foot upon Prospero. I was raised among the mendicant logicians of Precia Magna, travelling the roads between the Universitrat city hubs, working to find mathematical patterns in the phrasing of imperial scriptures, and offering these insights to young scholars and labourers in exchange for arms. When we crossed paths with travellers around the spaceport, we would exchange tracts and treaties with them, and that was how my family came into possession of more esoteric works, passed to us in secret with whispers of truths that the most eminent scholars knew but would not teach to any save their own favourites and sycophants. We applied our calculus to these new texts and were steeped in wondrous and terrible revelations, insights that came so easily. It was like picking up treasure from the ground after a lifetime of battling to pry open locked vaults. As Crove spoke, the mist and fire below him swam up into a little tableau of light that acted out the scenes he was describing. We counted ourselves students only, always seeking understanding, but while we pursued our studies, we were being studied in turn. These disciples were stoking the light of my own dormant gift, and when they perceived me, the thousand sons acted. This was not the true legion of Magnus, ignorant as I was of that when they appeared among us. For all their dread bearing and proud demeanour, these were lackeys of Araman, the librarian, the meddling exile whom Magnus had barely spared from death. They took me away without a word. This was just after the breaking of the forty-first millennium. My proper education began, built on the foundations the secret tracks had laid. I learned to master passion and delusion and dominate the ocean with will and intellect alone. Thirsting for knowledge, I began to elaborate upon my master's principles in my own ways, every waking moment ablaze with insights and possibilities. Araman did not remain my master. One of the roving magistars of the core of the Thousand Suns intercepted us in the galactic northeast. I took no part in their battle but sensed it waged with weapons and wills across the nameless world where Araman had landed in search of, I still know not what. They were driven from that rock before their search was successful, and I was taken as a trophy into the court of Magnus the Red. And now the doors of learning were truly thrown open to me. I laboured for the sorcerer Abenhak, on deriving the seven syllables of the seven true names of the Nurgle prince, Fortre Rotchok, and then he released me into the service of Sulabe, the arch-invoker, who set me to work refining the principles by which his warding and summoning sigils were formed. My labours added much puissance to his own, that he made me first among his adepts, and taught me the third and fifth concatenations by which we would counter direct the eight fundamental immaterial temperaments. In contrast with Zedron of Nine Towers, he had me create and enact a ritual by which the warp radiance from a human psyche, as divined in the works of Karakon the Elder, was matched in three secondary nuances of character to the tempest flashes observed in the epistles of Gel. Zidon acknowledged the Edeps of Sulabi to be the better after my success, 
and when I used elements of this ritual to bind and discognate the demon Harkadol, I was once again brought before Magnus and dressed in the livery of an aspirant mage. In the glowing mist beneath him, Crove's fire puppets made gestures and wrote signs that caused the air to groan and spark. Now I was taught warfare. My gifts and spells were honed to a martial edge, and I mastered the baser, more physical weapons of the Legionis Astartes. I could loose an unearing fusillade from a bolter, fence with a chainsword, command one of the Legion's ancient vehicles, march to battle with one of my battle brothers, or one hundred of them, and know what was expected of me with never a question or order needed. I rewrote my soldiers' doctrines with the incandescent skills of a mage. At every step, I was tested. I remember a battle of 162 hours beneath a sky crowded with silver towers against two hetmen of Magnus. One plucked up stones and bones from the plains and hurled them at us upon tendrils of thought laced with scarlet sparks. The other unlaced the safe fabric of space and distance and sent crawling, crackling runes to uncouple our minds from our senses. I alone remained master of thought and limb, commanding the others in the fray. When the test was done and the towers spoke to one another in the voices of their masters, they acclaimed me, declared me no longer aspirant, but adept, and gave me those others who had survived as the core of my first coven. I was brought war gear, the hollow armour of a legion brother long dead, I reshaped it alongside the Legion's finest forge magi, engraved it with warp work so that it blazed with living etheric fire where once had been the simple energies of its reactor pack. When I donned the armour, I was plucked from the foundry floor to hang in a cell of folded space while the armourers assaulted the defences I had made. They tested my forge work my spell carvings, the connections from my spirit into the armor's anima, the predatory instinctual spirit weaves just short of mines that I had patterned into each tooth of my chainsword and each round loaded into the magazine of my pistol. Such was their power that the simple attention of their minds scorched my body and soul, but though they picked apart my designs from every angle in four dimensions, they could find nothing that displeased them, and I walked from the seeing mount to begin my studies with. But here, Crow, like Amishai before him, was cut off by his host's fury. Be silent, Crow, be silent, be silent, thousand son. For Crow was still attempting to speak. When the sorcerer realized that Chengal would brook no further speech, he shrugged and allowed himself to sink back to the ground. His ghostly pantomime collapsed back into glowing fog, which whipped around Crow's ankles, stirred the writhing hem of his surcoat, and was gone. This time Chengrel's tank made no movement, but behind it in the shadows came the tread of metal on stone. No more, Crow, he repeated. No more from any of you. Go from here. Be among your fellows. You shall hear from me in the daylight. Chengrel wheeled his tank about, moving it deceptively fast on its stubby legs. The two terminators carrying the bag of stones were already departing. Amishai sat with his head down and made no move to leave. Drachmus had leaned towards Hodir as if to speak, but the latter turned his back on the rest of the assembly and got to his feet. Crove, however kept his position in the centre of the stone circle. He said quietly, I have not finished speaking, sir. The other three turned and looked at him, but Crove continued to stare after Chengrel and his retinue. Out in the dark, the sound of armoured tread stopped. Emishai closed his lips around his stretched tongue to slick them. Hodair and Drachmus exchanged a look and then moved quickly and purposefully out to Crow's flanks. There was silence for a moment. My account is not done, 
Crow said. I understood that we would treat with one another here as equals in comradeship and respect. I trusted that we would each present our bid to you, and even these accounts you saw fit to demand of us, and be heard. I came here ready to graciously acclaim any of these others whose bids I believe to surpass mine, and to leave with no other prize than their fellowship, and yours. But I am denied. You have not heard my account, or what I offer as my bid. Master Emish Ai has likewise been refused full hearing. You are a poor host, Master Chengro. My fellows and I deserve more respect than you show us. Away in the shadows, a moving light appeared. It was the window on the front of Chengro's tank, coming into view as he wheeled around, the green-white glow from inside the tank brightening as he stampeded back towards them. Respect, he roared. Respect for you, you worthless, bloodless little inbreed. You disgrace to the gene line of Magnus. Had you any understanding of respect, you would be prostrate on the flagstones now, begging my forgiveness. A bank of bolters cresting Chengrol's tank hulk rattled through sixty degrees of elevation and barked a salvo into the interlaced bow overhead. This is base betrayal, he shouted over the crashing and burning debris around him. I sent out more than a hundred heralds, and this is the respect shown me? For such weaklings, we are Legionis Astartes. We strode out in fire and blood to be humanity's living gods of war, and we waged a long war to split the galaxy asunder and remake it, to make the Imperium weep for the day they failed us. A defiler had stampeded into view on each side of Chengrel's tank, and shapes moved on all sides of the lamp-lit circle of paving. But now I see treachery indeed, Chengrel went on. A pack of scatterbrained infants who do not understand the task their gene seed brings with it. I expected accounts of blows struck against the Imperials. Worlds burned, lords and generals cast down. Revenge on the legions who would not march with us into righteous rebellion. Accounts of you fulfilling the purpose for which your Primarch's genes were placed into your misbegotten and ungrateful bodies. And what did I hear? From you, how oh dare, I hear that the children of Kurs are so dissipated that you brag of being able to pluck some fat supply convoy and must beg for my help, assaulting an imperial fortress. Drachmus, you tell me how your word bearers barely managed to hold the line against imperial invasion. Crove, your legion of all of them must have a grudge burning white hot against the emperor, but instead... As if the burning of Prospero meant nothing to you, you yap about tempest flashes and concatations and fundamental temperaments. Tell me of the tempest flashes you inflicted on our erstwhile brothers in war. Tell me of how these concatations helped you to bring even a single imperial life to an end. You cannot. You betray your heritage and waste yourself. And from you, Amish I. Chengrel was no longer shouting, but his voice was blistered with contempt. What possessed you to be anything other than ashamed? Crushing an imperial city for no other reason than to thwart another legion? Thwart a brother as great as Typhus? Where is your pride? Have the shallow glamours of your patron blinding you to the fact that if we all turn on one another so, there will be none left to strike at the golden throne? How may we weld ourselves together again into a force to raise terror with such as you in our ranks? And you demand to know why I will not hear your bids, Crove. Do you understand now? Do you understand why I will allow none of you this prize until your legions can send me champions who prove that the fires that Horace kindled in us all still burns hot? Tell those thousand sons you claim to speak for that their ambassador is a poor specimen indeed. If he'd intended to say more, then it was lost. For a moment it seemed as if some terrible weapon had detonated in front of Chengrel's tank, for the space on the flagstones was filled with blue-white blaze. When the light passed, Crove once again hung in the air, suspended off the ground in sizzling cobwebs of lightning, his staff pointed straight 
between Chengrel's eyes. And what of you then? he demanded. Mighty Chengrel, revered iron warrior, great Chengrel, acclaimed by his warsmith. Chengrel, who once managed to sack some imperial hives at the head of an army and fleet, and whose greatest accomplishment since then has been to build a hideaway in a sector so gutted by war that he would be safely beyond challenge in a sackcloth tent. At this, Chengrel let out a bellow, and his bolters coughed out a bright cluster of shots, an arm's length from Crove, the shells tumbled in the air and scattered away from a sparkling rune that had not been there a split second before. "'What are you, Chengrel?' Crove went on, as though nothing had happened. The lightning had spread to form an arch that framed him. "'You set yourself up over us, sneer at our histories.' You brag that you had fought in Horace's lunge for power, as if that were some badge of greatness. You, who marched in the rank and file ten thousand years ago, praise for your prowess by your warsmith on Medrangard itself, you say? Were you one half, were you one third of what you boast of being, your praises would have been born in the throat of Perturabo himself, not some vassal outside his gates. And if you were such a magnificent beast of war, Chengrel, why must you style yourself with titles like Master? After a hundred centuries to prove your worth, why are you not a warsmith yourself? Bring him to me, roared Chengrel in reply, as the weapon armaments unfolded from the sides of his tank and two rotary cannons began scouring the ground and throwing up dust and rock chips. A defiler scrambled past him on its cluster of metal legs and sent a belch of yellow flame towards where Crove hung, and without looking down the Thousand Sun caught the blast and stilled it in mid-air as though he had imprisoned it in a picture of itself. A moment later the flame, now glowing cobalt blue, shot through with scarlet and emerald, reversed its motion, reversing back into the defiler's flame tank, which exploded in a ruinous fireball. "'Traitors, all of you!' screamed Chengrel through the din. "'The long war is not done while the Emperor sits on that throne on terror, "'and all we have left is fops and cowards "'who will not do what it takes to settle the account.' "'Even as he crashed forwards, bolters and cannons tracking, "'the left cannon mount fell silent. "'Hodair had glided forwards with perfect calm, "'slipped between two hulking thralls whose senses were full of flame and gunshots, and gutted the cannon's mechanism with a single precise jab of his power knife. Now he spun to defend himself as the grunting thralls closed in. "'Us!' cried Crove as a burst from Chengrel's other cannon drove Drachmus back from his outer flank, the little demon scrambling for a grip but continuing its monologue with not a syllable out of place. "'Are you so stunted, Chengrel?' So trapped? Leave your so-called long war to the elders, all eaten up with spite, who cannot drag themselves out of a rut of ten thousand years. Think of all the chaos offers you. Think of the power and grandeur. Think of what you have built already, and what you could achieve if you let the great ocean pour through you and push wide your understanding. Think of what awaits you if you would just shrug off your dreary little feud and strike out to explore. You are the traitor, Chengrel, traitor to the potential our forefathers saw in us when they turned their backs on the Emperor and led us into the void. Think on that, Chengrel, and learn shame. A shocking storm of gunfire erupted on the left flank. Drachmus's word-bearers, waiting in the dusk, were hammering Chengrel's followers with bolts and cannonades. On the right, a pack of household thralls hacked at Hodir with power rams and combat blades to find a moment later that they had shredded an empty cloak. Next instant, the creature holding the cloak pitched over dead, a smoking hole in its forehead from where Hodir's power knife had punched through its skull. As the corpse fell... Hodair lifted a pistol in his other hand and shot the thrall overseer through the throat. Chengrel's dorsal bolters blazed again, and once more Crove undid the salvo with a gesture. This time the shells began to dance in front of him, leaving trails of sky-blue light that formed strange letters in the air. Chengrel snarled in anger, and the snarl emerged from his speakers as a squeal of static that detonated the bolt shells. 
The concussion did not harm Crove, but sent him skittering back through the air. Fire and lightning spread like a second cloak about his shoulders. The long war gives us meaning, Chengrel shouted as he stormed forward. The war is our purpose. Our Primarch swore it so. How dare you turn away from the pacts that we made before Horus and each other. Traitor. I name you traitor. He would have said more, but now the chassis of his tank crashed through the sigils that Crove had left hanging in the air. As they cracked, the space around them seemed to crack too, and suddenly Chengrel was surrounded by the dazzling spectres of light that cohered into harder physical forms. Squat blocks of pink glowing flesh, split by chanting mouths, swarmed about the tank's legs. Cackling and clawing at the joints, beaked and toothed things with skirted mushroom stems for bodies bounded in circles around Chengrel and his defilers like children about a bonfire, breathing streams of coruscating light that crawled across their enemies' metal skins. Darker shapes screamed about the defiler's turret, leaving furrows in its armour. Soulless, substantless little remnant of a man, sneered Crove with blue and silver light now blazing from every seam of his armour, a rippling disc of silver-white metal manifested beneath his feet, and he stepped down from mid-air to stand on it. The war is as good as won, and we are the victors. We who understand. The Imperium means as little to us as the tawdry ambitions of those who cannot bear to stop making war on it. The only losers in your precious long war are those who were unable to let it go. You and your Imperium deserve one another. Next to Changrel, the Defiler's cannon boomed, but there was no seeing where the machine beast's shot had gone. A second later, one of the capering pink demons vaulted up its side and rammed a grotesque arm straight through its turret plates and into its innards. And yet you swagger in front of us, demanding that we prove ourselves your equals, Crove went on, scattering from his hand a sizzling radiance that pierced Chengrel's followers like quills. It is no small satisfaction to me that I could not do so. What true heir to the Primarchs would wish to lower themselves to equality with such as you? The obscenities that burst from Chengrel then were too foul and fast to comprehend, for his speakers could not keep pace with his rage. A streaking missile from Drachmus's followers shattered his remaining cannon before it could fire. Chengrel's vision swam with red and black as feedback from the hit lanced into him, but all his attention remained on the incandescent figure of Crove in front of him. He fired his bolters again and again, and although many of the shells vanished in the sorcerer's aura of flame, some had been warp-touched by Chengrel's smiths and crashed home against the ancient blue armour. Chengrel's roar as Crove lurched back through the air was one of feral satisfaction. While this melee blazed at the meeting space, a second contest, smaller but no less fierce, had begun on the road back to Chengrel's palace. The two Iron Warrior Terminators were marching onwards with the Soul Stones when the auto senses of the rearmost registered movement and heat in the overgrown ruins that should have been empty. Straight away he lashed the ruins with double combi bolter shots, beginning in an ancient Legionis Astarte suppression pattern, then abruptly switching to a semi random drill designed to catch a target who might have learned the same fire pattern. Walking backwards, gun still nosing the night, the Iron Warrior watched tracking overlays and hit readouts. They showed plumes of rock dust, splintered vegetation, a little cloud of atomized sap where a bolt had punched through the bowl of a twisted tree. But both he and his armor systems knew, from bitter lessons begun on Isfan, the look and sound of a bolt shell hitting Space Marine warplate, and there had been no evidence of that. Then a melter blast slagged the plasteel bond of the combi bolter, and an eye blink later the white hot wreck of the weapon was blown apart by the shells still in the magazine. Startled but not frightened, the Iron Warrior shook weapon fragments off his gauntlet as his companion's reaper cannon sent a salvo at the source of the blast. The two warriors had just enough time to close together before a quick lunging figure raked a chain blade across the leader's faceplate. 
precisely exploiting the weak spot in the Terminator suit's range of movement that made it hard to twitch the head aside from an attack on that one vector. The Iron Warrior's eye lens was damaged and his vision jittery with feedback, but instinct took over. There were three ways an enemy could dodge after that lunge. Two were back to safety, but the third carried forwards and would allow a grab at the bag of stones on the way clear. Without looking, he swept the bladed barrel of the Reaper through that space and was rewarded with the sound of splintering armour and a cry of fury. But now more Night Lords were joining the fray. The Melter Gunner shot a blast into the leader's faceplate that destroyed several sensory inputs and overwhelmed the others for whole seconds. That was long enough for Hodair's power knife to begin hacking at the arm whose gauntlet fist still held the bag. A terse bark of battle cant between the two Terminators communicated Hodair's position and the Night Lord realised how long he was taking and what a mistake that was when the muzzle of the Reaper cannon clanked into the pit of his left arm. Even in the split second between contact and firing he was twisting away presenting the Iron Warrior with a curved armour surface for the shells to carom off. But that could not save him completely, and the triple shot spun him four metres away with an ugly crater in his armour. The Iron Warrior holding the stones felt another blast of heat that failed to injure him, but damaged enough of the fine componentry in his arm that the limb locked stiff. From behind him came the crack and flare of a thunder hammer, and he heard the curse as his companion went down on one knee. He twisted so that the bag of stones would be carried away from the Night Lords on that side, but now pain sizzled in his fingertips, and he snarled in frustration as he felt the bag being snatched away. Then there was only the two of them, part crippled, firing a hail of shells into the dark, where the Night Lords had vanished. Hadair gave a liquid, agonised cough as his fractured rib carapace ground and his lungs worked to expel the blood already half-clotted in them. But meanwhile, his thoughts danced with what power he could purchase now that the prize was out of the clutches of the pompous Iron Warrior fool. Strange and avaricious dreams filled him, such as he had not remembered having before. These dreams, Hodair realised, did not even seem to be his own. The dance of his own thoughts was alien to him. At that moment, his brother Night Lords let him drop to his knees on the ground. Hodair looked around and saw that his band of reavers had stumbled to a halt. Some were readying weapons, but clumsily, with none of the fast and lethal cohesion born of so many thousands of battles. One or two of them were even making little jerking motions as though resisting some mad call to dance, gasping and crying into the vox. With the ethereal song of Slanesh trilling from his distended lips, Emish Ai sauntered into the group. His two slaves still trailed behind him, but behind them in turn came an extravagant parade cloaked in pastel light and scented steam. Hodair had faced their like before, but there was no preparation or readiness that could protect him from the savage ache of desire that flashed from his skull to his heels. He wanted to move with their beautiful rhythms, laugh like them, be like them, and these desires barely faltered when he saw them take the head of one of his warriors and drop it to the ground in a shower of blood and laughter. But still... His pistol kicked and the creature who was reaching for the bag of stone shrieked and rippled. For a moment it was something whose features took all those strange desires and wrenched them back on themselves, and then it shrieked as Hodair's power knife opened it from throat to belly. That damage was more than its will to stay corporeal could override, and the demonette shivered into nothing. The thing's destruction managed a moment of ugly counterpoint to the blanket of hypnotic noise, and the Night Lords, whose minds had needed only the slightest opportunity, seized on the change and fought. Now suddenly, the Slaneshi cavalcade had to contend with resistance. Curved claws and barb-tipped tongues clashed with blades, hammers, and desperate point-blank bolter shots, but Emish Ai would not be denied his prize. Shivering from the resonance of the sonic discharges in his bones, Hodair shivered anew as Emish Ai's finger quells slid into his arm. His hand went warm, then numb, and Emish Ai plucked the bag from his fingers. 
Hodair saw the ruby light from the stones kindle in the Slaneshi's own eyes, and then he brought his power knife up and jammed it into Amishai's hip. The man convulsed, the wounds in his pin tongue opening into seeping holes, and his red reflecting eyes stared into Hodair's face for a moment. Then he backhanded the injured Night Lord to the ground and scampered lopsidedly away from the fight, doubled over the bag of stones he held to his belly, with his slaves dragged along behind him. The mistrustful Chengrel had ordered his troops to prepare a killing ground for his guests even before they had landed and now his warriors prepared their positions at the landing camps. These were Iron Warrior combat engineers, crafty and capable. They threw open carefully concealed foxholes and enfilades and used scatter munitions to lay down instant fields of crack mines and webs of memory wire strong enough to entangle even power-armoured legs. Shadow quiet, they moved in amongst their new trench works, their fire lanes already planned and directed, ready for Master Chengrel's fleeing guests. But of course, their enemies were space marines too. Each point the Iron Warriors had chosen to fortify had been anticipated by the Night Lords, and the first team found themselves dealing with ambushes of diabolical precision and cohesion. Newly opened foxholes were already trapped. Iron warriors simply vanished on the way to their positions. Odd bursts of interference interrupted the vox chatter, no matter which band the iron warriors used, just enough to muddle their commands and make their attempts at organization worse than useless. The attempt to cut off Drachmus's retreat did better, but when Drachmus left Chengrel and Crove to one another's mercies and struck out for his ship, he had more warriors with him. In time to his gargoyle's recitation of the spiral catechism, he marched towards his landing camp, with his bowl of burning ashes held high and his banner bearers behind him. The iron warriors in his way almost laughed at the crude approach, but caught themselves. Drachmus was making himself so visible for a reason. They realised that reason barely in time to mount a fight against an expert word bearer's pincer assault, with Drachmus at its hinge. On the far left flank, the Iron Warriors around Emish Ai's battered little cruiser was bogged down in a hellish firefight against the ship's guards, noise marine artillerists who fought with percussive rumbles that could shake armour and bone apart, and shrieks to rupture flesh from cellular membranes on up. Into the middle of this came Amish Ihe himself, his demonic retinue left behind to finish the fight against Hodair's elite, dancing through the Iron Warrior's line. He chirruped laughter as one armoured figure after another fell to his warp screams and the venom of his finger quills, and when the last scrap of resistance was desperately falling back, he could control himself no longer. He leapt and cut capers on the blasted ground, scoring his slave skin with the spines and hooks of his breastplate, and leaving the welts and wounds slicked with the secretions of his tongue. That was how Crow found him. The sorcerer had fought Chengrel to a standstill, the warding and working of the tank, and the sheer brute force of the will driving it had been enough to blunt most of the assaults Crow had cared to throw and the fury of Chengrel's assaults did not allow him to prepare deeper and more potent measures. Finally, Crove had redirected one of his attack calculi through a false logical form, outflanking Chengrel's wards and hitting home. The forelegs of Chengrel's tank turned from metal to an elephant blue crystal, then instantly shattered under the tank's weight. As Chengrel howled his fury into the dirt, Crove had turned his back without further ado. He did not hail Amishai or curse him either. Crove had had enough of words, and so he threw his staff down like a javelin into a spot not far from where Amishai danced. Suddenly, Amishai found that he was mired in something that seemed to be at once tarry liquid and clinging dust, and after a moment found that he had sunk from his ankles to his thighs. Seeing Crove standing on his disc up above, he launched a savage witch howl that might have stripped armour and flesh from the sorcerer's body, had he not dismissed it with a gesture. Now, Emishai was up to his waist and screaming with anger. He held the bag of soul stones up to keep it from becoming submerged, and, like hot air before him, felt it being plucked from his hand. What had taken it, not even his senses could discern, but as he sank up to his chest, he saw Crove hang the stones from his belt. 
Now, casting about desperately for leverage or footing, Amishai saw his slaves. Like him, they were trapped and sinking, but they had leaned together and put their heads on one another's shoulders. Each careworn face now carried a small, sweet smile, for they had realised that soon they would finally be free of their misery and would go into oblivion together. That stung Amishai more than the loss of the stones, that he could not prevent his slave twins from dying happy, suddenly seemed the most profound of defeats, and he groaned and wept and tried to lunge at them, as the ground finally took all three of them under. A moment later they were gone, and Crove looked about him. Doubtless there were ambushes around his lander too, but they did not matter. Crove had descended from his ship by more direct means, and the blocky golden craft in his camp was nothing more than a diversion. Now it buckled and faded as Crove dissolved the knots of force that bound it together. The sun was starting to rise, and Crove could see the great ring of fortifications take shape in the dawn. Here and there was a bark, and a twitch of motion as the last of the brawl among the word-bearers, iron warriors, and night lords played out. Amishai's retinue were not to be seen, having tumbled back into their craft in a panic when they saw their master die, or melted back into the warp. Crove's left hand dropped to the bag of soul stones at his belt, and his right extended. After a moment his staff flew up out of the ground and into his grip. There seemed no good reason to stay longer, the sorcerer murmured a word, followed it with another, and departed for his ship in a soft thunderclap of displaced air and a flowing burst of light. In the time before the ravages of the final Wa Ungskar and the beginning of the Grey Blood Tribulations, Chengrel of the Iron Warriors built himself a fortress home upon Burjan's world in the Mitre Gulf. He dwells there still, although his lordly demeanour is not quite what it was, and many of his iron warriors have now departed from his service. Chengrel has spent much time combing the ruins of Burjan's world for another prize like the one that was stolen from him, for he is convinced that with it he can once again purchase power and alloys. When he floats in a circle inside his tank hulk, so that his head nestles in the scraps of what was his body, he still broods on revenge. But now, rather than revenge on the golden throne, he plots it on the legionaries who came to visit him after that long-ago summons, and who betrayed him so bitterly and foolishly. Crove of the Thousand Sons would be amused by that, should he ever learn of it. If he and Master Chengrel should ever meet again, doubtless he will point the irony out. Thanks for watching, everybody. I do hope you've enjoyed this. A bit of a long one. That's why I split it up into three parts. And uh, my voice was getting a bit... Uh. Anyway, really appreciate you guys watching. It means a lot that so many of you enjoy the work. Really, genuinely. I love doing this. It's great fun. I really enjoy it. I don't know why. I do. Uh, to those of you who have been supporting the channel directly, and I know a few of you guys have been supporting me for a long time now, just want you to know it really makes a difference with me um, putting this much effort into it. And I, I'm aiming to put a video out every day, if possible, and I want them to be of at least, th at least the quality you're used to. I don't want to lower the quality. So I'm trying my best to put things out as often as I can, uh, just to show what, what your money's going towards, basically. And um, just want you to know, you know, it, it really helps me justify to myself putting in the work and putting in the effort. So to you guys especially, thank you so much for your continued support. I will be doing more stuff soon, so stay tuned to the channel. Please do remember to like, subscribe and share if you can. That really helps get people to watch the videos. Otherwise, I will see you next time with more stuff. Thanks for watching again. Really appreciate it. See you later. Cheers.